The latest adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter has dropped on Peacock and in theaters. Is it lit or a dumpster fire? Let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your thoughts on the latest adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter. Did you love it? Did you hate it? And give me that point of reference. Have you read the book? Have you seen the previous version? I'd love to hear your take on it. One thing before we get started, this video is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook of your choice by signing up for a free 30-day trial of Audible. Audible. So you can get Firestarter for free. You can get one of Stephen King's epics like It or The Stand for free just by signing up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. I am a massive fan of Audible. This year I've already listened to over 20 audiobooks from Audible. I do highly recommend it. And if you're a Stephen King fan and want to start diving into his books, this is a way that you can do so for free. The link is down below in the description and let's get started with my background with Firestarter and that's to say I have never read the book and I watched the original Firestarter with Drew Barrymore for the first time within the last seven days. So this is a series that I don't have any nostalgia for. I don't have any deep connections to. I thought the older one was kind of interesting but certainly not one of the better Stephen King adaptations and I really didn't have any expectations going into this new version, though I was very concerned because they didn't do any press screenings and they decided to release it straight to Peacock and in theaters, which is something that was very normal to do last year, but seems kind of weird now that theaters are opening back up. So what did I think about the movie? Here's my thoughts. And for me, this was an exceptionally mediocre and forgettable film. There's a certain amount of professionalism on display here with the special effects, the actors that they brought in, but there's just nothing about it that stands out. And I think even some of that is that even based on the source material, I don't think that this was ever some of the best stuff that Stephen King ever did. And then more importantly, here we are 40 years later, and this type of story about people that get powers and then they're on the run from some sort of governmental organization, that story has been told so many times over the last 20, 30 years. And even the little details about people taking specific drugs and gaining the powers, parents with their children, we've seen all of this before, many, many times before, and we've seen it better. Maybe the Stephen King book predates all of that, but there's nothing in this film that brings anything new to this story that's been told many, many, many times before. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm brand new to this series, having never read the book and having only seen the Drew Barrymore original version a few days ago. I think this one did some things that I think improved upon the structure of the original one. This one gives you more time with the family before the chase, the running begins. So you kind of understand them a little bit better, give some context for caring about them while they're on the run. But then on the flip side, this one dramatically shortens the back half. It's, it's weird. It's like the one from the 80s had way too short of a, a first act, not enough setup. And this one takes out all of the development in the back half of the film that was in the original one that kind of worked. In which case, I feel like well, there's two different versions that feel like they were missing a big gigantic piece and both of them are pretty short. So either one of them easily could have expanded a little bit longer to have a more fleshed out story. But, but here it, it feels like right when you start to maybe get invested in things, it, it just kind of takes you off uh, it just immediately drops you into the middle of the third act and then the credits roll and you're like, what, wait, what just happened? That didn't feel like that was developed at all from where we were to where we are currently. It's also a film that all throughout it, there's some very strange editing choices that kind of take place. And it, and it felt at times like they shot an R-rated movie and then they cut 
little seconds and little bits of it to get a PG-13, it felt like that. Except this movie's rated R, and so I don't know what they were doing. There's all these times where there's a person standing there and it cuts to the girl going, ah! <laughs> Shooting fire from her hands, and then it just cuts to something like a dead body on the ground. Like they didn't want to show the person getting torched because it's just too gruesome to have a child torching someone to death. So the way that they cut it was really odd. The way that it was shot was strange, like something was missing there. Um, as you kind of move into the back half of the film, there's all sorts of sections where it, it feels like there's dramatic gaps in characters, character arcs. In particular with the guy that's kind of the main villain that's, that's hunting them throughout the film. Where, what they do with his character in the last five minutes, feels like it came out of the blue. And part of it, I was like, I can, I can kind of see that, but then it keeps on going. And I was like, really? How does, this doesn't feel earned, right? This doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm not, I'm not tracking with this at all with what's going on here. And so you, you have a movie that, I found it watchable. It was fine. It didn't make me mad. It didn't step on my toes. I, I didn't feel like it was totally egregious. There's a little bit of satisfaction when you have this family that's been so wronged that you get, you know, that payoff at the end where, you know, the girl gets to go full fire starter and has a little bit of control of her power and is just roasting people and stuff. There's some fun in that. I guess that makes me a sicko, but <laughs> None of it feels earned, fully developed. It's it, it it's like a movie that clearly needed more time to, to, to develop the script, flesh things out to earn the payoff at the end. And you know, just there's just a lot of like the whole thing just kind of falls flat where the idea of this organization that like tested some drugs on people and then they realized that they, they created some people that are too dangerous. There's interesting conflict in that. There's a line that's in both versions about what if this girl grows up and gets so powerful that she could be like a nuclear bomb that she doesn't have full control of over, and so what do we do with a kid in that situation? That's an interesting conflict of realizing you've created a weapon that is a serious threat that isn't, like, you, that doesn't explore that. It just plays the, or the government as villains and it never gives them enough humanity to actually care about that dilemma of like, what do you do with a little girl that's really, really dangerous? In which case, you just kind of have a movie that's forgettable, that's underdeveloped with characters that you, you can't care enough about, and uh, then a finale that comes out of the blue and some character arcs and twists and turns with them that you're just like, what? What is going on here? And it, it, even beyond that, there's just moments that, like there's so many moments that feel like you, you should have a much bigger reaction to it. There's one involving the little girl and a cat, and then there's a number of things that happen in the third act and kind of closing out certain characters' journeys. And when they happen, on paper, it's like a horrifying, it's emotional, it's all whatever you wanna say. And then in the movie, it's just like, and then that happened. You just don't feel anything. And I think so much of that is this just feels like a generic, by the numbers, one of these stories that's professional enough in its aesthetics and shots are in focus and actors are professionals and everything like that. But there's just, just nothing to it. There's nothing, nothing that elevates it above all the other movies like this. It's just another one of them, in which case it's a very, very forgettable one. Let me know what you thought about it down below in the comment section. Remember to give me that point of reference. Is this your entry point for Firestarter? Have you read the book? And if you have read the book, actually, can you give me some point of reference as to each of the translations or iterations of it? Which one's closer? Because I have no idea. But I would love to hear you guys take, especially give me that point of reference with your experience with the Firestarter book and previous adaptations. As for me, I've seen both versions, not really a big fan of either one of them. I think the original one probably was a bit more interesting just because it had just enough kind of 80s cheese and goofiness to it that had some things that made it interesting and stand out. And this one's just totally generic. 
There's just nothing about this one that you will remember after you see the film. Didn't offend me. It was still watchable enough. It wasn't like just a total disaster and dumpster fire to me, but just utterly mediocre and forgettable. Overall, I'll give this one a C on the entertainment scale, like a five out of 10. And if you're like really a Stephen King fan, just check it out on Peacock. This is not a movie that you need to go to the theater and pay 10, 15, $20 to see. Remember, you can get a free audiobook by signing up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. And if you wanna see my rankings of some of my favorite horror franchises, check out that playlist right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.